No, so thank you very much, all of you, for being here in this panel. And it's a pleasure to start another panel for the second day of the EBCI conference on the Google case. And I'm going to just uh, pass the, the, the word to Stravos. Thank you very much for uh, having this panel. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the invite. It is a pleasure to be virtually, at least uh, with you. Uh, so let me jump uh, immediately to the case. Before discussing the case, uh, just let me share with you what I find quite fascinating and perplexing when we talk about digital competition. And this is that it looks somehow like an optical illusion. Well-informed and in bona fide, I assume interlocutors disagree about what's happening out there and how we should go about it. That's why we are experiencing now a boom of publications, so many um, readings, so many, so, so many works as a, as a bedtime also uh, entertainment. Uh, so, so it's spectacular that according to some authors, we are experiencing cutthroat digital um, competition between ecosystems which provide, try to disrupt it, it, each other or undercut each other and provide more, better, more innovative goods. And then there is this creative game of destruction. So there is fierce competition. Whereas according to others, we are actually experiencing a dystopia where a few powerful platforms extract disproportionately value. They erect insurmountable barriers to entry and they stifle innovation. And I think Google Android is a case that is particularly interesting because it showcases these two different ways in a sense or these two different narratives towards digital competition. So on the one hand, Google and its behavior and services is a boon for the consumers, is heaven on earth. We have a lot of, a lots of, lot of good um, apps, freebies, cupcakes. The Android is an open source software. We have the Google search, Google Chrome, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, because Google is not in the charity business, it has to monetize its non-revenue generating apps. How? by through online advertisement. So online advertisement covers 88 to 89% of its total revenue. And on top of this, Google cannot relax or enjoy the quiet life of the monopolist because it's feeling the cutthroat um, competition of Apple, right? This was the case um, when, it came, when it comes to market definition, um, Alessia and Constantino will be talking about that. So, Google is pushed to innovate, to perform better, to invest uh, in R&D uh, because of Apple. This is one way to see the Google story. The other way is the commission. So the commission, as we know, was not particularly satisfied with specific aspects of Google's behavior. The commission was particularly concerned about three types of restrictions. The first one was the so-called MADA agreements, through which Google was tying um, its search, Google search and its browser, Chrome, with uh, Play Store. So according to the commission, this was a tying practice aimed at controlling the entry points to um, um, internet search. The second type of agreements were the anti-fork agreements, according to which the uh, mobile manufacturers that uh, wish to have the, uh, to use Android uh, should not use any unauthorized forks, even though Android is an open source software. And the third type of restrictions according to the commission was where the payments that Google made um, to mobile manufacturers and MNOs, mobile uh, network operators, in order not to install competing search engines. <clears throat> Excuse me. So according to the commission, these complementary yet interdependent restrictions were part of a common strategy, a strategy that were, was focused and aimed at protecting Google's castle, the search engine, building modes around the castle so as to ensure its, its dominance in there. On this basis also the commission found um, these practices as amounting to a single and continuous infringement. 
So now let me let me just focus on the time bit. So, okay. Okay. So let me just focus on the time bit. So um, as I said, the time the time problem was that Google was tying Google search up and Chrome with its Play Store, and therefore on this basis it was abusing dominant position in the relevant markets. Before uh, getting, delving in, further into this, I just want to mention four points of principle that I think is important to have in mind since they are a distillation of, um, of uh, age old precedent. So the court reiterated in this case that it is, it is in no way the purpose of Article 102 to prevent an undertaking from becoming stronger and more successful in the market, nor is the purpose of Article 102 to protect less efficient competitors. Competition on the merits, the court repeated Intel, uh, post one, right, is by definition, uh, by definition leads or might, may lead to the marginalization and then elimination of, as efficient, of less efficient competitors, excuse me, or of competitors that provide less attractive goods in the eyes of the consumers. To this, the court added, not every exclusionary effect, therefore, is an anti-competitive effect. But in order to identify an exclusionary effect, we need to ask the question whether this practice makes harder access for, to the market for actual and potential competitors, and therefore gives an advantage to the undertaking, and then the dominant undertaking is able to negatively influence competition, stifle innovation, and harm the consumers. These are the three main points of principle. And the fourth is that this analysis, the benchmark for this analysis, and this is again, all precedent. It goes back to uh, associated um, STM. Uh, the benchmark for the analysis is the competition that would have existed in the absence of the agreement. So now let's have a look at time. So the court repeated the old test the traditional approach. So in order to establish time, we need to have two separate products. The undertaking, the company has to be dominant in the market for the tying product. Com consumers should not be given the option to obtain the tying product without the tied product. And as a result, competition in the market should be foreclosed and the behavior should be deprived of any objective justification. These are the elements that the plenty for the commission has to establish, to establish. But according to the traditional approach, and there are statements in this regard in previous case law, conditions four and five, so foreclosure of competition and the absence of an objective justification were somehow inferred by conditions one to three. So it was relatively easy to establish time or time would be considered a restriction by object or presumptively unlawful. We can, we can put it in that way. However, we see here that the general court starkly says in a clear cut way, continuing Microsoft, that it is not sufficient to assume that competition in the market will be foreclosed if conditions one to three are satisfied. We need to look more closely, more carefully and examine the real and actual effects of the practice in the market. So then we see that Tying becomes something more like a restriction by effect instead of a restriction by object. So there is this change. Then the relevant question is how much analysis? And again, here we have two views, as I was saying before, it's a rabbit or a duck. So according to the commission, these tying practices were problematic because they were conferring a significant competitive advantage to, to Google. Uh, Google was able to exploit the status quo bias and the commission took a lot of effort to establish the existence of this status quo bias, but the existence of a significant competitive advantage is not enough to establish an abuse. So the commission went further and assessed the, the, the impact of this behavior on the market. And it inferred that it makes it harder for competitors to improve, it seals Google from competition Rivals have less incentives to invest and consumer less choice. Therefore, Google's behavior entrenches 
uh, a position of dominance, increases barriers to entry, deters um, innovation and harms the consumers. This is the commission story. On the other hand, Google's story is that here we have a, a software which is constantly improved. The commission hasn't really carried out this counterfactual test. It hasn't really proved how competition would have been better in the absence of uh, these ties. On top of this, according to, to Google, because of these ties, was Google able to monetize and offer these freebies um, to consumers? And rivals, furthermore, had other effective means for, of reaching the consumers. For instance, downloading. And to this, I, I, I just need to add that the ties did not constrain the freedom of uh, mobile manufacturers uh, to pre-install other browsers. But the commission looked at what, actually, what was actually happening and found out that um, mobile manufacturers were not really, even, they, even though they were free contractually, they were not really engaging in this behavior. And the court, to close the story, the court was satisfied with the commission's view. So the court was convinced that the pre-installation of Google Search and Chrome conferred a significant advantage, which could not have been, could not be offset by rivals. And this had a freezing effect in the market. And Google was not, and excuse me, and the court was not convinced neither by um, Google's claim that you should take more, you should, the commission should have taken more into consideration the pro-competitive effects of the practice. The, the court was satisfied that the commission um, did that properly, nor was it convinced the court by Google's objective justification that these ties were necessary for Google to recoup its investment. There were other less restrictive alternatives according to the court. So now, sorry, my last point is what is the future of time or, or what is the takeaway of, um, from, from this case? First, we see that pro-competitive effects play a more prominent role in, in tying analysis. Now the commission has to um, engage in a more in-depth examination of the effects of the behavior because in principle, tying is considered to be also a source of pro-competitive gains. We see also that in order to establish anti-competitive tying, three are the key elements, significant competitive advantage that cannot be offset and it has the tendency to lead to anti-competitive anti effects. Then we see that both the commission and the court adopt a pragmatic and context specific view. So they ask what is actually happening in the market? Is there status quo? What is the actual behavior of the mobile manufacturers? And in the end, in my reading, Google Android could be seen as a story, as a, the, the case could be as a successful story or as a good way to run the tying cases. Because in, in my view, this is a way to protect the effective, an effective competitive process. The key criterion here is, is this practice or strategy, overall strategy, strategy making access to the market for rivals significantly higher, harder. If, if, if that's the case, then we might have a problem. And we see also that in order to address this question, the commission asks and the court goes along the same way, whether we can differentiate between performance competition, for instance, improving quality and impediment competition, for instance, pre-installation that cannot be offset. And the second one is a deviation from competition and the merits. So with this, I would like to stop in time and give the floor to Alessia. Hey, thank you very much, Stavros. You raised a lot, a lot of very interesting points. I think that gives us uh, a lot to think uh, about and discuss in the next uh, hour or so. Uh, let me share my slides. Um, Okay, you should be able to see the presentation now, oh, yeah? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, my title is very broad, but um, actually I will focus on something a bit more um, specific. 
Uh, and then I'm happy also Constantina will talk about market definition. So she can add probably another angle to the discussion. Uh, when I started off uh, looking at the market definition in this case, I thought, well, you know, there are some issues, but it's pretty straightforward, actually. And then the more I looked into it, the more I realized, well, it's less straightforward than I thought. So uh, I try to understand it and, you know, present you a specific angle. But if you have, you know, a different understanding or, uh, yeah, you know, you disagree uh, with what I'm saying, I'm very happy to hear what you think, because it's still something that I'm kind of trying to figure out. So um, the Commission defined four different markets. And the one I will uh, look at in particular is the market for the li licensing of smart mobile operating system. Um, and the... Um, the commission defines the market, what is inside the market, what is out of the market, you can find, you can see it here. What I, I think is interesting is the last point. So uh, what uh, the commission says, the um, smart mobile operating systems that are non-licensable, like the Apple operating system, but don't belong to the same market as the licensable uh, smart mobile oper operating system like Android. It kind of makes sense, right? But let's think about it a little bit more. Um, so what is the main issue here? And also this was what was disputed by Google. The fact that actually Google or like Android does compete against Apple, the uh, operating system. Um, so how, um, you know, why is it so, like, wh why do we have this problem? Well, I think it comes mainly from the fact that uh, Apple has a different business model. It is vertically integrated, so it doesn't license its operating system, although it still has an operating system that in some way does actually compete against Android. So how do we make sense of this? Um, so we have multi-sided markets. So I think, uh, so I went kind of a step back and try to see what can we, uh, you know, understand or learn from that. Um, so we all know, uh, you know, theory behind multi-sided market. So we have a, a platform that sells different products, different consumer groups, um, and these consumer groups are on different sides of the market, fair enough. But then, so what does it mean for market definition? In particular, how many markets do we need to define? And here um, we have basically three sides of the market. We have the operating system, then we have the uh, original equipment manufacturer that needs to have access uh, or want to have access to the um, smart mobile operating system. But then we have developers that develop app for that and we have consumers that use it. So these are the, the three sides. Uh, if we think, so the previous slide, um, Apple has a different business model. Well, in Apple's case, we only have two sides. So we don't really have the separate uh, equipment manufacturer because it's still part of Apple. So this is where the, the problem is. Um, so when we think about how to define markets uh, that have you know, different sites, uh, often we uh, distinguish, or one way to do is to distinguish between transaction uh, platforms and non-transaction platforms. So uh, transaction platforms uh, are platforms where the two groups actually you know, transact directly among each other. Um, so for example, uh, Airbnb and Uber, you will have the you know, us as guests wanting to stay in, in Airbnb, we transact directly with the hosts, same with Uber. Then we have non-transaction platforms where, um, you know, like Netflix and Facebook, where we don't really transact with the, the you know, the advertisers, for example, or the producers of uh, the movies uh, or series. Um, so when it comes to um, multi-sided markets, um, so one way to, to decide how to define this is to say, uh, and this was suggested by you know, multiple people, uh, is we have one market, one single market. If you have a transaction, uh, because you know, think about it, the, um, with Uber, the, the market is the provision of uh, you know, taxis or driving services. And it's just, that's the one market. And for both sides, this is kind of what the market is, right? Uh, if you have a non-transaction, platform, it's, uh, it makes more sense to define separate markets because, you know, if you think about uh, your advertisers and users, they, they are in there for, they do two different things, like the, the market is completely different. So um, I think that makes sense. I see some nodding, everybody is following. Okay. Uh, this brings me back to like the Corona teaching time where you're just speaking and then you see the students being like, yeah, yeah, okay. So I hope it makes sense. Um, so, well, the, the commission doesn't really uh, kind of agree on that 
we should define the market in this way between like like the how many markets we need to define should not depend on the fact if it's a transaction uh, based platform or not, but they keep it a little bit more open and they say, well, it depends on what type of platform it is. So, uh, you know, what the business model is and how the two sets interact and other factors. Yeah, but ultimately when you really uh, like, you know, read this document and think about what they're saying, they're saying something really similar because um, ultimately, it, what type of platform it is and how the sites interact is a lot dependent on if it is a transaction based platform or not. Um, but so what does the, the commission do in the Google Android case? It defines only one market and the market is the one that you know, I showed at the beginning. Uh, I mean, it, defi it defines for different one, but now speaking particularly about the one for licensable uh, operating system, it just defines, defines one of them. And it takes the perspective of the OEMs. Um, so it says, well, if we think about uh, the um, operating systems, well, the, um, you can, the substitutability is only with other licensable operating systems because uh, uh, the, the um, like OEMs cannot get access to the uh, Apple operating system, right? Kind of this makes sense. Um, so it says, okay, it's one market. We kind of ignore the other sides uh, of it. We just look at the, um, the OEMs. Um, so, you know, it, it does look at both the supply side and the demand side. So it says, well, Apple and BlackBerry, which is, um, you know, the other uh, known licensable operating system they consider, they have not licensed the operating system. They have not announced that they would want to do that. And also there was some evidence suggesting that even if they decided that, that they would do it, it would take quite some time, like two years. So from the supply side, you don't really have sustainability. From the demand side, kind of the, we know it's quite obvious, the um, original equipment manufacturer cannot get uh, a license to, to use these uh, operating systems. So no substitutability, different markets. But the problem is uh, that actually there is competition and the commission sees that there is competition. So, you know, usually when you think, okay, these are, uh, we, we define the market, the, the, the users and the, um, the user side and the developer side are not part of it, then they shouldn't compete really if you know kind of if it's a separate market but uh, and this is what google criticizes They're like well actually the fact that there are other sides of the market is not irrelevant because they constrain our behavior so why do you ignore them commission and the commission says oh yeah well it's true that we exist but they there is a there are direct constraints on google so i think um that's why i think it's a little bit I mean, it makes sense, right? But then if you really look at it, I find it a little bit confusing. Like how do you, what do these indirect constraints mean? Like, why do we even discuss them? I mean, it kind of shows that this whole market definition, although it makes sense, is a little bit kind of, it's maybe missing some um, like kind of rules or, you know, it's not really done like properly, but, um, so I was thinking, well, maybe let's look at how it has been done in other cases and uh, in Microsoft, uh, where we have like a similar scenario there, uh, the commission actually, you know, had an easy way out because they said, well, actually it could be like a distinction could be made. And it was against, again, with uh, Apple was, you know, the, the other option with, um, you know, operating systems that are not licensable. But they were like, oh, we don't really need to look at it because it wouldn't make a difference because Apple had a really small market share. So they didn't really get into it and they just defined one market, including everything in this case. Um, so, okay, well, it wasn't so helpful, but they did say, uh, you know, th there wasn't, there was some thought here into it. Uh, but then, so what does it mean? And I'm getting here uh, already to the conclusion. Um, so I think the challenge is we have uh, different business models and um, you know, they have, we have this issue of multi-sided markets that the commission didn't really get into. And so it kind of limited itself instead of discussing how many markets do we need and how do, the mar how do these markets relate uh, to one another? What are the constraints? It just defines it from the perspective of one side of the market saying that the competition from the other sides are indirect. Okay. 
But uh, the question is, does it really matter that this is not so clear and it's not so well defined? Well, um, I, I, I found this presentation from uh, 2017 from Christiane and Oliver, and I actually it was about the market definition and digital age. And here they say, actually, they discussed this very case. And they were like, well, this whole discussion about is Apple in or not of the market is actually not so important. And actually, the, what, what matters is uh, whether Google has enough power to extract concessions from the OEMs. And but the, basically, it makes much more sense to focus on the theory of harm uh, than to focus uh, on the market definition. And actually, I have seen this uh, repeatedly in like, uh, you know, I think also in the uh, well, OECD, I think, documents on market definition. Anyway, this thing that we should move away uh, a little bit from, uh, from, you know, wanting to define markets really well because of all these issues in the digital markets that make it hard to, to define clear market and set the boundaries and just look at uh, the, the theory of harm. Um, yeah, so those were my thoughts. I hope it made somehow sense and maybe, uh, you know, will give us uh, grounds for discussing it later. Um, wait, how do I stop sharing? Alicia, if you don't manage, that's fine because I don't have slides, so don't panic. Yeah. I can yeah, start yeah. speaking to make sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's in the share screen, in the share screen button. Alessia, I'm thinking it's on the top of the of the screen, but I think Constitutional can start because. Of... Yeah, sorry, because the the page like okay, okay, now I can do it. There you no, go. It. There you go. Yeah. Great. Sorry for that. <laughs> so shall I go for it? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Please. Very good. So many thanks to both uh, Stavros and Alessia for the excellent presentations, and they definitely give us a lot of food for thought. As Alessia mentioned, I, I will focus uh, on the definition of relevant markets too, but I will approach things from a slightly different and perhaps even more niche angle. So first of all, Alessia, I agree with everything you said on market definition, and I'm really happy to see that we're on exactly the same page. I wanted to focus today on the role of quality and quality-related considerations in uh, uh, the Google Android judgment. And I will explain why. Uh, as Alessia pointed out, this is not a very straightforward case. One might think, well, yes, I was expecting that, but then one uh, uh, reads carefully the judgment and you realize, well, the, the court might have gone, you know, might have been a bit generous with the commission and might have gone a bit beyond than what we actually expected. So um, focusing on the role of quality, I wanted to discuss and raise three different issues. First of all, I need to explain how we got here. So how did we get here? In other words, what if any role has quality played in similar cases in the past? The second issue is how does the court deal with the commission's assessment of quality related considerations? And finally, uh, moving forward and looking into the future, what does this mean for the enforcement of competition law in other cases involving digital markets or more broadly other markets, but also for the Digital Markets Act, which has now uh, uh, been published in the official journal and we expect it to start to apply. So starting from how we got here, I think it goes without uh, saying that for decades, quality was considered only in the margins, um, especially in the case of markets where quality was a parameter that should have been assessed, should have been measured, and uh, should have been considered properly um, either through quantitative research or through uh, qualitative criteria. So an example from the offline world is, of course, the example of newspapers. But moving into the online world, if we see Microsoft Yahoo, we realize that it has many similarities to Google Android. Not because um, uh, they are both antitrust cases, they are not, one is a merger case and the other one is an antitrust case, but in Microsoft Yahoo, what the commission said was that, uh, you know, we will focus on the advertising markets, there's no market for general search results, and even if there is one, we decide not to focus on it. And that was it pretty much. And then, and the, what is uh, particularly important for the purposes of this case, it uh, discussed quality degradation. 
And what the commission found in that case was, well, uh, users undoubtedly attach importance to the relevance of search results. And if Microsoft, Yahoo were to degrade the quality of search results, users could simply switch to another search engine. Uh, the commission did not consider whether actually users do that and whether they would even realize the degradation of quality in search results. And of course, we have many similar examples to refer to in the digital economy, most recently uh, the Facebook WhatsApp decision. So essentially, the main conclusion here without, you know, to cut a long story short, is that in most cases, price was the main factor. And in a wide range of markets where the focus could be on ad markets, or more generally markets with a pricing element, this is where the focus was. So we certainly didn't see the commission deploy a small but significant non-transitory decrease in quality test every other day. Now, why is that the case? Is it because quality is not important? Absolutely not. It's just that quality is notoriously difficult to define, especially by reference to the, specific, uh, uh, the specificities of a given market, but it's also notoriously difficult to measure and assess. However, given the importance of uh, and the high profile decisions in the digital economy, we realize that, you know, this is something that we actually need to focus on. So this is changing, and I'm quoting a very interesting extract from the court's judgment in Android. There are markets which fall within the digital economy, where traditional parameters such as the price of products or services or the market share of the undertaking concerned may be less important than in traditional markets compared to other variables such as innovation, access to data, multi-sidedness, user behavior, or network effects. And even if the SSNDQ test was not common practice, as I mentioned, the court defends the commission by saying that in the case of a product that was very unlikely to lend itself to the classic hypothetical monopoly test, the SSNDQ test did constitute relevant evidence for the purpose of defining the relevant market. Competition between undertakings can indeed take place in terms of price, but also in terms of quality and innovation. And here, if we go through the relevant extracts of the court's judgment, there are a few issues to consider. I will focus on three. First of all, what does the court tell us about the approach adopted by the commission in past cases? Because clearly this was something that was picked up by Google and Google said, well, commission, you never did something like that in the past. How do you do it now? And why did you decide to run this test now? And uh, there the court said, in any case, the commission is required to carry out an individual appraisal of the circumstances of each case without being bound by previous decisions concerning other undertakings and other product and service markets. But my question is, what about the particular circumstances of similar cases and similar, if not identical, product markets? So more generally, do I agree with the commissions and the court's approach about integrating quality-related considerations in this case? Absolutely. But it also raises issues from a legal certainty standpoint, right? The second issue that I wanted to, to bring to your attention is the trust in the commission as to how quality was assessed, which kind of reminds us uh, the leeway that the commission has more generally to conduct economics-based analysis. So Google complained about the fact, Google and other companies that intervened in support of Google complained about the fact that, you know, this was a bit of an obscure test. We didn't actually realize how quality was measured and how the test was run. What did the court say? The SSNDQ test did not require a precise standard of degradation to be set beforehand. All that matters is that the quality degradation remains small, albeit significant and non-transitory. So that was pretty much what the court said. And my question here is, will this approach survive in the future? I'm not so sure because at the end of the day, and even in the case of Google Android, it was actually possible to define some quality related parameters in advance because those quality related parameters, guess what, are discussed in the commission's decision, but also in the court's judgment. And finally, uh, uh, looking into the future, uh, the impact of, of quality parameters on competition law enforcement and the DMA, uh, clearly, I think that this judgment paves the path for more decisions of its kind, um, decisions adopting the same approach, largely relying on uh, quality-related considerations. And with respect to the DMA, one issue that I had in mind as I was going through the judgment is that clearly uh, the court refers, and the commission, of course, in its decision, referred to a, uh, a number of parameters like switching costs, 
customer loyalty, network effects, data-driven advantages, and the lack of data portability. And this kind of reminds me Article 3.8 of the DMA, which essentially allows the commission to designate gatekeepers on the basis of qualitative parameters. So I'm thinking that the leeway that the court has given uh, to the commission it might actually be reflected in future litigation concerning the Digital Markets Act. And I'm mentioning this, and I will finalize my presentation with this, because Article 3.8 is very controversial as it currently stands, because we say that the commission can designate essentially on the basis of quantitative criteria without any constraints. And it can also designate on the basis of qualitative parameters, again, without any constraints. So I think that this leeway that the court gives uh, uh, to the commission is telling of how the Digital Markets Act and the specific provision will be interpreted. And I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. So um, I think it's my turn now. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I would like to congratulate everyone for preparing this event. Um, and uh, just in the interests of transparency, I should disclose that I have acted uh, against Google in various proceedings. I am um, an associate at uh, Gerard and Partners, which is a competition law firm in Brussels and London. Um, so um, I have acted against Google, but not in relation to Google Android. So um, Stavros has already um, made a very good presentation of uh, you know, the court's analysis relating to um, the MADA pre-installation conditions, which as Stavros mentioned, the court, the, the commission analyzed as a form of tying arrangement. So there were two bundles. So I would like to touch on three specific issues that Stavros already mentioned, but perhaps I will try to go a bit um, deeper in, in those issues. One of them would, is the legal test for tying and the distinction that the court drew between actual effects and potential effects. The second one would be counterfactual and the third one would be um, cause a link. So indeed, um, the, the court started its analysis by observing that, well, the commission states that it followed the legal test let down in Microsoft, whereby it simply has to, to show that the contact is capable of restricting competition. But then the general court says that even though that's what the commission says, in reality, the commission did not do that. In reality, the commission tried to establish factors that are capable of showing, no, sorry, I shouldn't use the word capable because it might be confusing, um, sought to establish factors determining that competition has in fact been restricted. And um, why did the commission do that? Well, because that was not a, cl a classical case of time, like in Microsoft, because users could readily download rival apps. So that's that's interesting. But what I also find quite interesting is that the court also took into account a temporal dimension. So it also um, let it also observed that, well, in this case, the conduct of question in question has been in place for quite some time. So the commission is not really carrying um, out a prospective analysis, forward-looking analysis. Rather, the analysis is retrospective, it is exposed, and so the Commission should be able to identify actual market developments. So I find this interesting because, for example, in other cases, similar arguments have been raised but have been rejected by the court. So in Google Shopping, Google raised a similar argument saying that, look, the Commission needs to identify actual effects and not merely potential effects, precisely because the conduct has been in place for quite some time. And to that effect, it cited the general court's judgment in Servier, but that was dismissed. So I found that interesting. I found this reference to the temporal dimension quite interesting, but I have to say that the way the decision is drafted, it's not entirely clear uh, to which extent this, let's say, consideration was decisive in the court's reasoning, or whether it was simply, let's say, the cherry on top of the cake. Yeah, I mean, you have to show actual effects because it's not a case of classical tying, and we also take into account this temporal element. So that's the first issue that um, I found quite interesting. The second issue, when it comes to the counterfactual, which Stavros mentioned, well, Google 
made a counterfactual argument, even though I think it raised it, it framed it differently. It didn't call it a counterfactual argument, but I think that's what it is. It said that, look, the MADA pre-installation conditions are really at the heart of my Android open source platform that I developed, and it's the way to monetize it. Without these conditions, without essentially having search pre-installed on Google Android devices, I wouldn't be able to develop this platform. Um, it didn't frame it as a counterfactual argument, perhaps because, um, you know, EU courts are not always um, receptive to arguments about counterfactual in the context of 102. Again, you can think of Google Shopping where the court said, well, there is no need to systematically carry out a counterfactual analysis. So instead, the Google said, well, the Commission did not take into account the legal and economic context when making this assessment. I think rather disappointedly, in my view, the court did not, did not really engage with this argument of Google. I think it, it sidestepped it a bit by saying, well, the Commission did not take an issue with the MADA model or the Android open platform as such. It only took issue with one let's say, aspect of the MADAS, which were the pre-installation conditions, which one could say that, well, that's not necessarily the case, because if the pre-installation conditions are at the heart of the model, without them, you would have no MADA, one could say. Then I think Google again made the point, but at the stage of objective justifications, where, where it said basically that I need that to invest, to recoup my investment in Android. And Without this form of remuneration, I would not have been able to develop Android. Again, the court rejects that. And it, it provides various reasons, among others, that Google would have other sources of revenues. But to me, the most interesting, let's say, argument or point raised by the court is that, well, from an example perspective, you would still have the incentive to invest in Android even without being sure that you will be able to recoup the investment through Android. And why is that? Because I think that that was a rather bold statement. Um, and essentially, I think that the general court there relied on the um, theory overarching the commission's, um, underpinning the commission's case that, you know, Android and Google's investment in it was a way for Google to protect its business model, to, uh, let's say, uh, protect itself from the risks posed to its business model um, by consumers shifting to mobile devices. And so the court said that in any event, you would have done this. That's what it implicitly said. Um, and the third and final point, because I, I don't want to take too much time um, from other speakers is that, when it comes to the causal link, um, I think it's interesting that the court seems to set a rather high threshold for Google and a rather low threshold for the commission, um, and seems to adopt a more light touch approach to judicial review in this context compared to um, other places, to, to other, let's say, issues such as pricing related abuses and the, the application of the sufficient competitive test. So there are at least two instances where Google challenged the causal link. One instance in the context of the MADA conditions, Google said basically that, well, there is an evolution of user shares in the market, but that's not the result of the, the pre-installation conditions. It's simply because my products are better. And Google raised a similar argument when it came when it comes to the anti-fragmentation agreements. Indeed, there were non-compatible Android forks that had failed in the market. There was no dispute over that. But Google said, well, they failed because they simply were inferior. It's not because of the anti-fragmentation agreements. And in both cases, the, the, the approach of the court is that, well, there is no, no requirement on the commission to distinguish between the effects of your conduct and essentially effects from other factors. It's, uh, it suffices that your conduct somehow contributed to this. Uh, put another way, Google would have to essentially establish that the effects on the market 
were exclusively the result of other factors and not of its own conduct, which one could say is a rather high threshold. So I do think that this could be read as being a bit in tension with, you know, this approach of the court whereby if any doubt in the mind of the court should operate to the benefit of the defendant. And we've seen the court, you know, using that to strike down decisions when it comes to the AC test. Um, on the other hand, it does involve a certain um, sense of pragmatism in the sense that, well, it's not really science. I'm not sure anyone can uh, ascertain with uh, precision to which extent Google's conduct um, contributed to the demise, let's say, of a rival um, product and to which extent that was the result of other factors. So I think I should stop here and um, looking forward to continuing the discussion. Thanks. Is it my turn? Right. So thanks very much to uh, Stavros for organizing the uh, panel and uh, the other speakers for being here as well. So my um, contribution will be based on a short paper I wrote for EU Law Live, which was published last month, uh, about the uh, General Court's judgment. And specifically, uh, the question that I would like to raise today is basically whether the tying part of the general court's judgment is legal or lawful. Um, another way of asking the same question would be to say whether uh, to ask whether it will uh, survive an eventual appeal uh, to the court of justice. I don't know. Do we know if there if, if Google will appeal the judgment or not? I haven't seen any news. I expect them to, but. Um, so, so if the if the, if the case gets appealed to the Court of Justice, uh, my question is, what's the likelihood that that uh, the Court of Justice will confirm the GC's decision? And the answer uh, basically is, I have no idea. Uh, so now let me uh, try to 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 explain why I I think this is a very difficult question. Um, I would like to make a general statement in this regard, and then. Uh, offer two specific examples. So the general uh, feel that I have when reading, especially the tying uh, part of the judgment, is that it reveals basically a, a, a fundamental cleavage in the case law as it stands now. Uh, so the question, is the judgment lawful, I think must be answered by looking at relevant precedents which are binding to a binding for the commission initially, and then the general court uh, in its uh, in its uh, in the appeal case, um, and there, my sense is that the general court's judgment did a very good job in basically applying the most specific and directly applicable precedent, which is the already mentioned uh, Microsoft judgment. The problem here, I think, is that the Microsoft judgment is the only real statement. Uh, regarding the conditions for tying, and uh, it's a general court, a court of first instance judgment, so we don't really have any confirmation on part of the Court of Justice as to whether these are in fact the uh, uh, criteria to assess a tying case like this one. Um, now, since this is basically the only directly uh, applicable precedent, um, and I think the general court in Google Android applied the precedent really well, I mean, I've seen some other commentators uh, claiming that the effects analysis in Google Android goes further than the one in, in Microsoft. I'm not entirely convinced of that, to be honest, because I think the Microsoft judgments also really focuses on, on what you may call an effects analysis, uh, a little bit you know, convoluted and perhaps the folk, folk economics. But nevertheless, there is a serious uh, uh, analysis of, of anti-competitive foreclosure effects. Uh, so I think the general court's judgment is really in line with that precedent. Now, I don't know whether the judgments of the Court of Justice in Intel and Servizio Elettrico Nazionale change anything about this. It seems to me that both of those judgments uh, aim to provide for a general framework to analyze uh, unilateral conduct under Article 102 focused on the principle 
that Article 102 is, is not intended to, uh, uh, to prevent less efficient competitors uh, from exiting the market. Um, if that is true, uh, then I think it's plausible for the Court of Justice to extend the very same principles on appeal in this case, which would mean probably either overturning the Microsoft judgment or perhaps more likely to say, like the court did in Intel, that the Microsoft judgment is the right framework to analyze time cases. But as soon as Google in this case offers a substantiated argument to the effect that uh, the practice in question is not capable uh, of excluding as efficient competitors, then the commission is required to uh, basically take uh, all uh, circumstances of the individual case into account uh, and see whether in fact this uh, uh, business conduct did have uh, the capability to foreclose equally efficient competitors. Now, if that's the result, then I don't really know whether the commission's analysis and the general court's judgment uh, meet that bar. I'm, not, I'm, I'm definitely not convinced of that. Um, the general question is, of course, should the as efficient competitor principle rather than test apply to conduct like this one, like tying, like, like other types of non-price conduct? And if it, if it should apply, what is how to do that, right? Uh, now, A.G. Uh, Rantos in the Servizio case offered some suggestions to this effect of applying a replicability test, for instance. If that test is uh, applied by the Court of Justice on appeal in Google Android, then first of all, I don't know whether the judgment will stand uh, of the general court. Second of all, I have no clue what that would look like. So I have no idea what a replicability test as, it, as applied to the MADA uh, a, a part of, the, of, of, of Google's conduct would amount to. So what, what, what would a hypothetical as efficient competitor be able to do uh, or to offer in terms of a bundle uh, like the one uh, that we saw in, that, that we have in the Google Android case. So I think the judgment is both uh, uh, wonderfully aligned with the relevant precedents at the same time, deeply at odds with what seemed to me uh, uh, are the general principles that the Court of Justice uh, espouses right now in terms of uh, applying Article 102. Um, now, two specific examples of, 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 of issues with the judgment, which I think will be very interesting on appeal. So Dimitris already mentioned the objective justification. Um, now, paragraph uh, 617, uh, uh, is about Google's claim that uh, these uh, bundles are necessary to provide uh, the Play Store free of charge. And there the, court of, uh, the, there the general court says that's not enough uh, because uh, there are other options, including uh, the payment of a license fee for the Play Store. So if you look at the Servizio case and the role of consumer welfare in the objective justification stage, I'm really not convinced whether this will survive the, the Court of Justice's scrutiny because uh, 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 presumably such a license fee will be passed on to consumers. So this alternative might be necessary uh, for Google if consumer welfare is, is, is the objective of Article 102. Uh, and the second uh, uh, specific point would be paragraph 452, where the, court of, uh, where the general court says, even though those RSAs, which uh, Elias uh, will, will discuss in detail, are not abusive as, uh, as such, as a factual element, whatever that means, I'm, I'm really not quite sure, uh, they can still contribute to the uh, foreclosure effect of uh, the tying part of the conduct. Now, I don't know what to make of this. So it's, it's of course true that one specific type of conduct as such, uh, it, it does not foreclose competition or is unlikely to foreclo foreclose competition, but it does contribute together with all other elements to a collective, uh, 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 a collective 
uh, combination of various types of conduct which does have a, an anti-competitive uh, foreclosure effect. But the problem that I have here is with the word capability, because even though it's perhaps unlikely that the RSAs uh, foreclose competition, but it is likely that they contribute to an anti-competitive foreclosure effect, I don't know whether you could say the same if capability is the standard, because if the RSAs are incapable of, uh, of foreclosing competition, then allegedly they're incapable of contributing to a foreclosure effect as well, right? So I think this reveals a, 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 a very deep division in the 102 case law where uh, the capability to affect competition is something completely different when analyzed in the context of price conduct than it is when analyzed in the context of uh, non-price conduct. Uh, whether this is desirable, I'm not saying there should be a, uh, a uniform test for assessing the effects on competition across the board of 102, but it does seem to me that what Google Android illustrates is that the relevant precedents that apply to the commission and to the general court in this case are radically diverging, which leads to a judgment in this case, which I think is compatible in every respect with the relevant legal precedents, and yet uh, it might well uh, be overturned by the Court of Justice, depending on uh, how it will rule on the uh, uh, extension of the principles in Intel. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. So I hope you can see my slides and also hear me. Okay, thanks a lot for, first of all, for organizing this conference and for inviting us and also to Stavros for putting together this panel. And I'm really extremely pleased to discuss the Google Android case today because I think it's in a remarkable case um, for a number of reasons. And we have already heard some of them. And I think my argument here will tie in very nicely actually with what just uh, Justin has brought out, namely that from my understanding, Google um, Android highlights the deep division in how Article 102 is applied nowadays to exclusionary non-price and pricing conduct. And we have already heard a lot about the tying element of this case where uh, we are confronted with an exclusionary non-price conduct and the general court has been quite generous here towards the commission's analysis. By contrast, we also have a second major theory of harm here, the revenue sharing agreements, so basically exclusivity payments, which are exclusionary non-pricing conducts and they have been, um, or the analysis here by the commission has been heavily criticized and quashed by the general court. So let me just briefly explain what these agreements were about. So basically the commission complained that Google uh, committed to pay uh, major original equipment manufacturers a huge share of its online search advertising uh, revenues, so up to uh, 30 to 50 percent of these revenues. And the theory of harm was that Google uh, provided these exclusivity payments as a uh, based on the condition that the original equipment manufacturers only pre-install the Google search app. So it's really a uh, take it or leave it exclusivity agreement. And they were not allowed to to uh, pre-install any competing uh, search apps such as uh, DuckDuckGo, for instance. And the commission argued, so this is really for closing other general search services from the national general search service markets. And in order to demonstrate the unlawfulness of those exclusivity payments, the commission carried out the famous as efficient competitor test here. And this is also in the US, for instance, known as the incremental price cost test. And um, the basic intuition here is to actually demonstrate 
that an as efficient competitor, a hypothetically as efficient competitor as Google would not be able to match actually Google's exclusivity payments without making losses. And the commission relied here as, an, uh, as the relevant cost measure uh, on the operating costs of Google, which it estimated to be between 20 and uh, 10 and 20 percent of Google's ad revenues. And the co uh, commission also highlighted here a fundamental issue that an as efficient competitor will face, namely, even if the as efficient competitor were to convince original equipment manufacturers to pre install their apps search apps alongside Google, a Google search app on their devices, this, uh, this as efficient competitor would only um, be able to actually capture a certain fraction of all uh, search queries. So a con contestable share, which is much uh, smaller than the non-contestable share of search queries that would in any case still go to Google search app. And as a consequence of this uh, difference between the contestable and non-contestable share, the as efficient competitor uh, would not only need to match Google's exclusivity payments, let's say 30 35% of um, the revenues from online advertising, but it would also need to compensate the original equipment manufacturers for the uh, uh, revenue pay payings that they lose um, on their con non-contestable share if they no longer comply with exclusivity. So you need to compensate uh, the original equipment manufacturers for these losses, and you need to do so on a much smaller market share. So this non-contestable and contestable share, the difference actually sh shows you the leverage effect here of the exclusivity payments. And um, the commission found out that in order to match, for instance, a 30 to 40% exclusivity payment from Google, the as efficient competitor would need to uh, offer exclusivity payment of more than 100% of the uh, uh, search revenues. And this would actually uh, no longer allow an as efficient competitor to match, uh, to, to, to uh, cover its costs. And therefore, on this basis, the commission had, this is an, un, uh, an unlawful exclusionary practice. The general court disagreed here with three major points. So first of all, it uh, criticized that the commission underestimated the contestable share here, uh, especially the commission relied actually on data from the PC search market segment in order to construct the contestable share um, and did not focus on the mobile uh, search segment in order to do so. The second criticism was that the commission arguably used the wrong cost measure here. Um, so the commission relied on Google's operating costs as a proxy for its uh, incremental costs and the, the general court said this is um, not the right cost measure. You should have looked at the incremental cost directly and especially you should have analyzed actually Google's own cost data uh, because the commission relied actually on third party information to construct Google's cost data here and uh, the general court disagreed in this regard also with uh, Google's analysis and on this basis found that the as efficient competitor test was actually flawed. Moreover, a major criticism that the general court also raised was that Google, um, uh, that the commission failed to actually to show that Google's exclusivity payments covered a substantial um, fraction of the relevant market. So it looked at the coverage rate and uh, found that the coverage rate of the exclusivity payments is only 10 to 20% of the relevant market. I think the um, underlying assumption here is then that other uh, general search services could still uh, reach original equipment manufacturers that are not covered uh, by these exclusivity payments and thereby compete. And uh, what is interesting here with this criticism though is that the tying agreements, so the MADA agreements actually have a very similar coverage share. And here the general court didn't raise any issues with uh, this limited coverage share of the tying agreements. So what is the upshot? I think the first key, uh, key takeaway, and I think here we 
um, Justin and I, we are very much in the same direction. We see a fundamental mismatch between how uh, the commission and, and the general court deal with uh, exclusionary pricing and non-price conduct. So apparently the as efficient competitor test Google uh, Shopping uh, says uh, tells us this is not uh, warranted for non-price practices, where it, whereas it is warranted in uh, certain pricing practices cases. Secondly, we don't have any analysis of the coverage rate for non-price conduct, and as a consequence of this, we actually end up with a, a situation where we apply a stricter standard to exclusivity payments relative to tying although the exclusivity payments actually impose a stricter exclusivity requirement than the tying agreements. So that's quite odd. And the fact that on the one hand, we are not protecting um, less efficient competitors uh, on, with respect to uh, pricing conduct, whereas we do uh, arguably protect less efficient competitors when it comes to non-price conduct. The, Second key takeaway, if we look at the coverage rate um, argument, is that actually a dominant firm can, if we follow the logic in, in Google Android, set its uh, prices below incrementally uh, incremental costs as long as the exclusivity payments just cover a very tiny market share. And this is to some extent in tension with existing case law, Postdenmark 2 in particular, which has not yet been overruled by the Court of Justice. And then the third takeaway is that apparently the commission and the general court seem to assume that the as efficient competitor test and arguably also the as efficient competitor principle are relevant, even though we are here confronted with a super dominant firm with market shares in excess of 90% uh, and with uh, important incumbency advantages. And this is also uh, in some tension with previous case law post Denmark, for instance, where the Court of Justice said under certain circumstances where we have such a super dominant firm, the as efficient competitor test is of no relevance because there's uh, simply no possibility for an as efficient competitor to emerge. And from my understanding, uh, this should be uh, a, a warning um, for all the enforcement of competition law in digital markets in particular, that to my understanding, the as efficient competitor test is not necessarily the right framework to protect effective competition in digital markets, but also beyond. And I conclude on this point. And I look forward uh, to our discussions. Thank you very much, everyone. I don't know if Stravos, you want to uh, make some comments. Uh, we have about 15 minutes to, can, like, everyone can, I know, speak a little bit. Uh, I think, you know, it's, so you, you can start Stravos, like, uh, about 15 minutes each one, I think, uh, some final. I was, I was just thinking that it's better to open the floor to everyone to ask questions and have a discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, I have just one comment, um, yeah, many interesting things to, to consider. I have just one comment for uh, Justin's um, uh, presentation. So my comment relates to the replicability test. So the, my concern is that the replicability test as prescribed in um, NL by Rantos can be under-inclusive and over-inclusive. Uh, and, and let me explain. So a patent in IP right might not be replicable, but this doesn't mean that you abuse it just because it's not replicable. And on the other hand, the Google case here, the Google Android case here shows that we can have anti-competitive effects. We can have a negative impact on competition. I mean, it's debatable, but I think the commission makes a compelling case. Therefore, if we adopt the replicability, this will kill this kind of cases. This is my concern with regards to replicability test, but I don't want to say more so that we have all inclusive discussion. Just because I think my comment is related to this one uh, with respect to the relevant as efficient competitor test for non-price conduct. So I think there's a fundamental 
assumption always that there is no such possibility to carry out such a test. And I think that's um, erroneous. And there is, for instance, also the possibility to, to look actually at the coverage rate of the conduct and compare it with the non-covered market share and then ask yourself, so could in a min, could an, an equally com, uh, efficient competitor still compete with the uh, on the basis of the non-covered market share? So the, this is the so-called minimum efficient scale or minimum viable scale test. And so to some extent, the general court killed here uh, also the application of this kind of test um, to, to tying uh, by not taking into account the, the coverage rate. Um, and I think that's um, something which is, again, highlighting the, the fundamental mismatch between uh, pricing and non-price conduct and its analysis uh, by the Commission. And I, I agree, though, that it's a very important challenge, actually, to, to think about what might be relevant tests if we want to go down uh, this route um, uh, under the as efficient competitor principle also for a non-price conduct. On that point, could I perhaps add something? <clears throat> I agree with um, what Elias and uh, Justin um, described with respect to this division in the case law for non-price interviews and price interviews. And in fact, I think that perhaps we will have some clarification from the Court of Justice in earlier than Google Android. We, I think we will do so in Google Shopping, because in my view, that's also it's a very interesting judgment because even though it supposedly applies the as efficient competitor principle as endorsed in Intel, so it says that, well, the purpose of Article 102 is not to protect competitors that um, are not as attractive. And in that case, um, we, we, we want dominant firms to compete on the merits, etc. But um, it's very interesting to see that the analytical framework that it applied, the general court, mm -hmm. to distinguish between effects that are, let's say, prohibited and effects that are accepted, was not really by reference to an as efficient competitor. Instead, it had recourse to the concept of competition on the merits. So it said that if we want to distinguish between the, the, the effects that are, let's say, prohibited and those effects that can still be part of the normal functioning of the market, we need to look at whether the contract complies with competition on the merits. And you could say that the as efficient competitor test essentially or was used as a proxy in the past to say whether the contract is in line with competition on the merits. On Google Shopping, the court did not really try to do that. It, it uh, actually, I also found it interesting that it didn't cite at all, it didn't um, use the word as efficient, even when citing Intel and the relevant parts of the judgment. Mm -hmm. So it, it really tried to apply, I think, a bit a loser framework by having reference to competition on the merits, which gives it, of course, some flexibility because then, okay, what is competition on the merits if it's not relating to the exclusion of as efficient competitors? And uh, we can have a discussion about that. Um, but in any event, um, I think we also need to have a discussion on to which extent when it comes to digital markets, and you have some very strong encompassing advantages, as Elias noted, we need to have a discussion about whether this AEC principle should have some exceptions. Because in some cases, it might be, let's say, um, preferable to protect less efficient competitors if it's the only source of competition that can exist. So if your standard if your benchmark is only the as efficient competitor, then there is really nothing you can do in that case. May I jump in because I have something here, Ivan? I completely agree with you, with you Dimitris, on this. Uh, so for me, the only way to square, in a sense, post Denmark 2 that has there the principle of, or an exception, right? Carves, carves out an exception with regards to protection of less efficient competitors with the broader principle statements about the asset efficient competitor principle is the following. The asset efficient competitor test is a cost-based one 
um, to be narrowed down only, okay, I, I understand the condition of the to pricing abuses, then there is the principle that of Intel or PostDenmark one, but this is under-inclusive in the sense that it shows some clear-cut examples where there could be an abuse, right? So you uh, marginalize an insufficient competitor, then there is an abuse. But there could be occasions where eliminating or suppressing less efficient competitors could be a problem. In this sense, I see Google Android as a case that talks about effective competitive constraints. So effective competitive constraints could be exercised, competitive pressure could be exercised also by less efficient competitors. And we have the post Denmark two statement is underdeveloped. So maybe Google Android offers a template to further invest in how to um, uh, articulate the concept of effective competitive constraints. So if I can add one sort of question or, or yeah, let, 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 let me phrase it in the form of a question. So I wonder whether you uh, would agree that the current state of Article 102 the Article 102 case law is, is, is very disturbing because it seems to me we can discuss whether there should be a sufficient competitive principle, yes or no, whether there should be exceptions over and under inclusiveness. But the more disturbing uh, uh, point that I think for me emerges from this judgment is that nobody has any idea what, what the law on Article 102 is at this stage. Uh, and, and, and that to be doesn't seem to be a, a desirable situation. When reading the judgment, I feel like the general court really did its utmost best not to say anything which is going too far or which is introducing criteria that did not explicitly uh, were included in previous case law. Um, but then there's almost no way to predict what the Court of Justice will say because it, 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 it could confirm whatever the general court has said or it could reject almost everything the general court has said based on, on general principles in Intel of which no one has any idea to what extent they apply to other situations. Um, so I don't know, I feel that the, 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 this is a serious problem, but perhaps I'm overstating the, this point. If, if I just can uh, uh, get on this point um, for, for one second. Uh, so. I completely agree, and I think one reason is the uh, very vague language of Intel. Um, and what happened with Intel is actually that the general court had a major defeat. And now the general court is actually trying to be the best disciple or student of the court of justice and actually wants to overdo what the court said. And so, for instance, in Intel Renvoi and also in Android and in Qualcomm, you see the outcome of this, that suddenly, for instance, the general court says, paragraph 139 of Intel is uh, a, a paragraph which sets out five cumulative conditions that you have to prove in order to show exclusionary effects, which is not at all uh, in the wording of uh, paragraph 139. Um, and um, a second example is that, um, now the uh, court, the general court speaks about um, uh, the hoffman la Roche presumption as a presumption that may indicate that uh, exclusivity payments or exclusivity uh, rebates may be a sign that the dominant firm may be uh, abusing its dominant position, whereas Inter says that the um, dominant firm abuses its dominant position. So I think there's a major um, push also from the from the general court to make itself a peer proof, and that might uh, further contribute to, to this um, to this mismatch. And I think there is also the upcoming uh, judgment in in the Unilever case where uh, uh, Advocate General Lantos actually suggests that uh, the Intel framework is to be applied across all the practices, which I think might be also giving uh, some further clarification. Anyone else wants to jump in or the 
Any questions from the attendees? Hmm. I, I have a question about the market definition part. So I completely agree that um, it's a bit odd how the, the general court um, reviews the, the commission's analysis there. And I just wonder whether, Alicia, whether you have a sense of how um, the general court or the court of justice could actually establish new limiting principles for proving when, uh, let's say, this um, competition that might be not direct constraints, but indirect constraints, when they are sufficiently strong so that they should be uh, included in the market. And uh, one sense would be to just demonstrate that the switching is actually in sufficiently high to defeat a, a price increase by the hypothetical monopolist. But I wonder how this could be operationalized in any kind of decision. So yeah, that's that's a good question. I was trying to figure this out too. I think um I think there is a problem with this indirect constraints formulation in the first place. Uh, I think if we were more rigorous in the market definition, if we decide I mean, it depends on what way we decide to go. Either we say, well, we shouldn't be so rigorous with market definition because in the digital market, it's just not possible. Uh, you know, just markets are not so clear and then come up with a new uh, guideline on uh, how then we should go about defining markets because for now the stance of the commission is still market definition is a vital part of the assessment. So we need that. We can't just skip that step. So. If, if we keep kind of this approach, then I think the only way to go is just defining, mar defining markets rigorously and then not having to face this indirect constraints. Because if we, if we said, well, this is, this is our market, uh, in two-sided markets, we say, well, um, um, we define the two sides of the market and we, um, you know, we kind of we put more work into figuring out how the two sides um, of the market um, you know affect each other, then it would be it would be easier to to say um, these um, to what extent there is competition between them. Sorry, it's kind of difficult to explain. But so basically, since the commission doesn't really define, doesn't really grab, like tackle the issue of the two-sided markets and just define that it doesn't even say if it's defining one whole market or if it's actually thinking there are different markets and it just decides to define just one side of it, saying, well, there are actually we should define sites for the consumer, for the uh, for the developers, and for the OEMs, and we just formulate, just define one market for the OEMs because it's the only one that actually regards us in this case. So it doesn't even say if that, that's its approach or if it just says we have one whole market that includes the other sites, but then doesn't really say well to what extent the other sites are relevant. So just to kind of bring it together, I think we should be if we want to keep market definition being like so important, uh, like essential part of the assessment, we need I think more uh, rigor in how to define them and what is inside and outside of the market and what is substitutable because uh, otherwise we are in a situation in, like in Google Android where the commission realizes that there is some competition but doesn't really want to engage with it and just comes up with this indirect constraint thing which doesn't make it doesn't really exist it, like it, it, we, you can't quantify it it doesn't really help us in any way. And in fact, it just says, oh yeah, I mean, we know there are some effects, but they are indirect. So, you know, we don't really have to regard them. So it's like saying to Google, oh, you know, you're kind of right that there is some competition with Apple, but, you know, we don't know what to do with it, basically, really. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Uh... Yeah. Can I ask a very short question to Alessia as well, or are we out of time? me yeah yeah so so you you, you say uh, there's only a focus on the market for oems uh, right uh, what what do you make of the uh, considerations of the general court regarding uh the price differences between android phones and iphones which is uh, related to the consumer side of the market um 
Yeah, so, I mean, the, um, since the consumer side of the market was in the end not seen as relevant, kind of not, not part of the relevant market, or not the perspective that was relevant, it was also part of the indirect constraints. So it's interesting you bring it up because then you can ask yourself, well, why did they even talk about it if it wasn't relevant? So I think uh, it was to, um, to yeah, it, it was kind of, I think, strangely to show, well, actually, even from the consumer side, there might not be so much competition because of the difference in price and just one category of uh, consumers, the one that spend more for the phones, they see them as competitors, but not even everybody. So already the, um, the consumer side of the market wasn't really important, then even if we do take it into account that on that side of the market there's competition, it doesn't concern all the consumers. So it's even less important. But, you know, again, it, I think it's, um, it's it's really awkward this discussion because obviously there is there are you know concerns that are legitimate and Google raises some really valid points saying well actually we do compete why do you, why like are you just ignoring that but yeah then it's not really integrated in the um, market definition discussion but at the end it wasn't important because it wasn't the perspective taken or that kind of mattered in the end. Sorry, but thanks very much. Uh, sorry, but I think the time is over. I don't know if you can close the... Uh, for, it's okay for everyone. So thank you very much. Uh, Elias, Alessia, Dimitris, Justin, Stravos, and Constantina, that was there and that was a very, very nice discussion and the BCI. Uh, thanks very much, Travis, for preparing this Thank fantastic you. panel with this excellent discussion. I know if you want to say something, Travis. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. A real pleasure discussion with you guys. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you. Very much. It was great. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.